Well, thank you very much, Madam Chairman, um, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to speak on aspects of fundamental rights with reference to asylum, um, but with a slightly different emphasis from Judge Bay Larson. I'm not going to fall, uh, I'm not he has dealt with cases such as uh, NS and Abdullahi and so forth and the Dublin regulation. And I'm going to focus on a slightly different, but I suggest no less pressing uh, question of um, fundamental rights in the context of asylum law. Uh, and that deals with the issue of, um, I suppose at the most general level, the interrelationship between the Charter, uh, the ECHR, and national, constitu and national constitutions. I'll say something about that at the start. And then uh, I'm going to, uh, for an another five or ten minutes, uh, speak um, uh, applying what I trust are those principles uh, in the context of what is possibly, at least for this jurisdiction, um, one of the most uh, uh, pressing and difficult uh, uh, questions. And I think um, looking at the case law that comes in particular to Strasbourg uh, is also a pressing uh, question for that court and many other um, countries as well. And that is the situation with which you'll be all familiar um, of where by reason of delays in the asylum process, um, which to some extent or another are almost intrinsic to that process and are very frequent in all member states, uh, regret to say not least in this one, um, uh, you have a situation whereby um, uh, asylum seekers come to a particular country, have children in that country, and those children um, rem either in some instances are citizens of that country or more recently are not citizens of that country but nonetheless have stayed in that country uh, for um, uh, all of their young lives. And in, in what circumstances um, can um, the deportation system operate, so to speak, to break up families? And um, that's, I think, one of the most difficult and pressing um, questions that uh, judges uh, at various levels uh, throughout the continent of Europe have got to confront. Because uh, we are faced with, and I, there is no simple and straightforward answer to this question, but we're faced with resolving two really uh, conflicting public policy options. And the public policy option on the one hand, which we mustn't lose sight of, is <clears throat> that there has to be, regrettably, there has to be a system of deportation uh, if you're going to have an asylum system. It's not very pleasant and nobody likes it, but it has to happen. And if you don't have them, if, you, if that is not a feature of the asylum system, well then I think um, we all know... Uh, we mightn't like to admit it to ourselves, but we all know that the uh, asylum system will ultimately break down. So that's one very impo important public policy consideration. The other very important public po policy consideration is something which is intrinsic to the European way of life, and, and not indeed uh, especially to Europe, but certainly in this continent it is a cherished feature of all our legal systems to one extent or another, and that is the protection of, fund of family life. And uh, it's very difficult uh, to explain to a seven or eight, I imagine, I haven't um, fortunately have had the obligation of doing it, but I'm sure it's very difficult to explain to a seven or eight year old um, who has lived, let's say, in Ireland all their life, that their father has suddenly been arrested and uh, um, uh, deported back uh, to uh, Nigeria or Cote d'Ivoire or uh, Cameroon or wherever. And the idea that in those circumstances, uh, if family life can be maintained in some kind of harmonious way, it's not easy to see how that can be done. Um, of course, you can say, well, the family can go back uh, to uh, Nigeria or, 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 or Kenya, wherever, but <clears throat> if the child has lived all its life in, let's say, uh, in Ireland or in some other European country, that is often more easier said than, than done. So those are huge problems, I suggest, and there's really no easy solution to it. Um, there's no judicial formula that can c come up that will solve it, uh, and it's a dilemma that um, simply will not go away, uh, and which is uh, which the courts are forced to confront. And um, for so long as um, society does not 
come up with an answer to it, and maybe the society and the legislators throughout Europe can't come up with, with a solution to it because there isn't one, um, well then it is a dilemma that the courts have to work out on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm going to say something about that in a moment. But <clears throat> before I do, and may I just say something um, uh, at a general level about the interrelationship between the Charter, the uh, ECHR, and um, national constitutions. Um, I don't know about you, I always struggled uh, uh, with maths at school, struggled with many other subjects as well, I assure you, but certainly struggled with maths. And um, uh, I always found it uh, really um, frustrating that you come to a new maths uh, topic and there was a problem question which um, the maths textbook solved for you. And when you looked at it, it was as easy as pie. But then, this is what was my uh, internal dilemma and I've never solved it, is you change the problem ever so little and then, um, you know, that the nice and neat example given in the textbook just simply didn't work. And um, I have to say, when I read um, Article 51 of the Charter, which is in some ways the most critical provisions of, of the Charter, the implementing union law um, uh, provision, and the explanation, the official explanation, which is taken into account uh, by the court, uh, and the Lisbon Treaty provides it can be so taken into account, um, uh, in interpreting the Charter, I had the same flashback uh, to uh, all those difficult maths classes of my youth because um, it is I think um, perhaps there was no other perfect solution to it either um, uh, the problem facing the drafters of the charter was they didn't want uh, in Judge Bay Larson's words uh, to, to constitute the Court of Justice as a general constitutional court or human rights court as such and on the other hand they wanted to have um, a fundamental rights charter for the union and there is also the danger that uh, unless uh, these so-called horizontal provisions were crafted carefully, that you could have a situation whereby the charter would effectively become a, a, a generally applicable uh, provision of union law, which would apply to all circumstances and in all contexts uh, in national uh, courts without distinction, uh, even though it's related to matters wholly internal to that member state. And you'd have a situation whereby, effectively, um, by the back door or indirectly, you would have a significant transfer of juridical sovereignty in sensitive areas to the Court of Justice, and they didn't want that. So the form that, was come, uh, that they came up with was that the Charter would only apply to member states when they were implementing union law. Now, of course, what does that phrase mean? And, I mean, I've seen a very interesting... Uh, uh, I've seen articles in the literature uh, which go through, I think, 27 or 28 different versions of the word in the different languages, official languages of the Union, of the meaning of the word implementation. And, you, you know, you have to be, I think, uh, very good at languages and linguistics, and I'm not, uh, to in order to... Uh, that was another thing I wasn't very good at school. Um, to, to try and work out, uh, to try and draw some conclusions from that. But the problem is this, is implementing. When is a member state implementing union law? Uh, if, for example, a directive provides, for instance, that, let's say, agricultural pesticides should be, uh, growth hormones should be criminalized, uh, obviously, uh, you, each member state has to enact a national law to provide for that. But, um, you know, at what point thereafter is a member state implementing union law? When, for example, the police comes to the farmer and arrests him on the grounds that he has used these illegal growth hormones, is that implementing union law? When they seek a search warrant to search his house, is that implementing union law? And you see, the phrase, I think, implementing has the problem that uh, it can mean something very narrow and it can mean something huge uh, on the most... Uh, <coughs> in the most extensive reading of it, it can mean almost anything you want. And um, that's where the explanation is, the official explanation is, I think, unsatisfactory. That's why it's like the maths problem um, uh, that I confronted all those years ago in the textbook, because it gives the shiny, easy example. And the shiny, easy example given in the explanation is, of course, 
ERT, the, the Greek <coughs> uh, radio and television case, where it concerned a classic example of implementing union law, where the member state <coughs> was exercising a discretion conferred by the directive. But I mean, that's the two and two example in the maths textbook. That's the, the, by far the easiest example. That's by far the most straightforward example. But the really <coughs> difficult ones on which guidance needs to be given, or might have been given by the explanation, are like my maths textbook, completely missing. Completely missing. And that's why I... I, I mean, we've got other things to talk about, but um, if I was... If, if, you, if you press me, and I hope you don't, but if you press me, uh, uh, I, 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 I'm not sure I would say the most kind things possible about the explanation. Um, it certainly, I think... Um, um, there are, it, it has its own limitations, let's put it that way, in terms as an interpretive vehicle, as a guidance to the court. At all events, moving on from that, uh, so therefore I suggest to you that the phrase implementing union law is the most critical provision in the charter itself. <coughs> but um, uh, the other unresolved dilemma, and perhaps it couldn't have been resolved. Uh, as Judge McGuinness said, this is part of the constructive ambiguity may be involved in the drafting of the Charter. Is what's the relationship between Strasbourg, the Court of Justice, uh, and the national courts? Now, Judge May Larson made the very interesting comment that you know, the Court of Justice is going to remain a general court and that ultimately uh, Strasbourg was going to have the last word. Um, uh, yes, I think that's true, and that's been clear, uh, I think, even from say, the decision of the, the Strasbourg Court in Bosphorus Airways, uh, going back, old, what, ten years ago, ever before the Charter uh, it, it came to full fruition, uh, that that was going to be the situation. But there are still, I think, a lot of difficulties, um, and that's especially true in the asylum area in terms of family, family law, and I'll come to that just now. And there, the difficulty is this, is that you have um, different conceptions of family life in the different member states. Perhaps more importantly, you have different understandings as to the extent to which family life is protected and should be regarded and safeguarded in the different member states and throughout the Council of Europe as well. Uh, you have got protections of family life in the Charter, Article 8, uh, and in, in, for the most part in national constitutions. And how do they interrelate? And how should they interrelate? Now, I think one of the most interesting judgments um, on this general topic of the interrelationship between the three uh, uh, you know, national constitutions, um, uh, the Charter and the, uh, EC, uh, and the ECHR, was given actually by the Czech Constitutional Court, as in, fortunately an English language version available, uh, from November 2009 on the Maastricht ratification. And the point made by the Czech Constitutional Court there um, uh, was this, is that in upholding or permitting the ratification, they said that um, the Charter was not intended to be a hierarchical document uh, whereby, in a sense, the Court of Justice spoke ex cathedra on questions of fundamental rights. That it was an interrelationship, it was a working relationship in which the national courts would have insights as well, and there was a sort of a dynamic between the various national uh, constitutional courts, both at member state level, uh, at court of justice level, and uh, at Strasbourg. And that was what they saw, and that's what they understood the, um, uh, the charter to be. And, there's a, perhaps a more elaborate, um, thought it was a very interesting passage, and there's words along those lines in the, um, uh, in the decision of the German Constitutional Court on Maastricht as well, vis-a-vis -vis the Charter. And I think that's important, because now coming to the question of, for the last five or two, if I can spend the next seven minutes on the question of family life, um, because <clears throat> there's no point denying that within... Um, if you look at both national courts, Court of Justice and uh, ECHR, there has not been a consistency on, the, on the, that fundamental question of the protection of family life in the asylum system. And <clears throat> if I can give just a number of examples. One <clears throat> from the <clears throat> Court of Justice, a, a, a slightly dated, but it still makes the point. Um, if you take a case like Phillips, 
from 2002. You had a situation whereby Mr. Phillips was married to uh, a Filipino national, he was a UK citizen, married to a Filipino national, she overstayed, uh, and the question was, should, be, should she be deported? Reference to the Court of Justice. And the Court of Justice ultimately held this would be a breach uh, of, um, this was disproportionate interference Partly on Article 8 grounds, partly on free movement grounds, because the critical point was that Mr. Phillips was a travelling salesman for, um, uh, think, I think, medical insurance and things like that, and he sold his wares right throughout Europe. And th his wife enab enabled him, therefore, to look after the... Because he was married, his, wi his wife could look after the, his children while he went off selling his wares throughout Europe. Um, and there's sort of a slight gender bias, I think, throughout... <laughs> implicitly throughout the, throughout the judgment. But the real point was that European law was engaged because Mr. Phillips <coughs> was enabled to exercise his four freedoms by travelling from the UK and Mrs. Phillips was there at home to look after the children. And, and if she wasn't, well, then Mr. Phillips wouldn't have been able to exercise his four freedom rights. And that was held to be a, a disproportionate... A, the, her deportation was held to be a disproportionate interference with the right to family life. Now... <coughs> Now, that's a judgment <coughs> that, <coughs> if I may say so respectfully, is not without its critics, because people say, well, um, you could easily convert that into an in something internal to the, um, to the UK. Uh, supposing, for example, nowadays Mr Phillips didn't have to travel at all, but could sell uh, his wares uh, over the internet, and probably is doing that. Um, uh, you know, would that, <coughs> would that have made a difference? And... Um, and that's one type of case that the Court of Justice has had to deal with. Then you deal with a whole type of ca series of cases um, uh, where the, uh, which you can I suppose, loosely call the um, insurmountable obstacles cases from the, co from the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Now, uh, I just don't have the time <clears throat> and, um, and to go into those cases in any, in any detail, but it's sufficient to say that... Um, Really, no clear principle has yet come uh, from those cases looked in their totality um, because the court is struggling with something that's really impo probably impossible to solve, which is the, the member state's interest in effective uh, uh, immigration control on the one hand uh, and the protection of fundamental rights on the other. And so therefore you've got cases say, look, there's been a series of Norwegian cases uh, gone to the court, gone to Strasbourg over the last three or four years, all with similar but slightly different facts and sometimes with differing results. And it deals with cases such as where children were born in Norway, <clears throat> Uh, have lived there for six, seven, eight years, uh, and then it is proposed to deport the, the, the parent uh, and the family is split up. Can they go back? Uh, can they go back to the country of origin? In one particular case, uh, you had a situation whereby the Nigerian married <coughs> a Norwegian uh, lady, they had a child, it was proposed to deport him, he'd been there for quite some time, the marriage was subsisting, uh, was it possible for the Norwegian wife to follow the husband back to uh, Nigeria? And I mean, one of the things that the Court, that the, the court of Human Rights mentions in passing, the majority says, well, uh, look, she spent some time in Africa herself, uh, and therefore it's possible for her to bring her child back to Nigeria. Now, um, <clears throat> Uh, as I say, those are case, there's a whole series of cases like that. We've had them in Ireland, uh, and uh, we've had, um, just to mention one, and to contrast it with the decision, subsequent decision of the Court of Justice, <coughs> we had decision, <coughs> our leading case, decision of our Supreme Court from um, uh, 2003, LNO, where you had, uh, this is a time when... Um, uh, everybody born on the island of Ireland automatically acquired citizenship. Now, <coughs> pardon me, the law was changed with effect from the 1st of January 2005, but that was the situation where you had um, a, a, a asylum seekers originally, they were, this was before the Czech accession, they were Czech and Nigerian, uh, and they had uh, very young children born in Ireland, both families. Question was, 
deportation orders against the parents, not as against the majority of the children who are Irish citizens, was that permissible? <clears throat> a majority of the Supreme Court, or learned it, um, Madam Chairman dissenting, uh, held that it, it was permissible. <clears throat> but a, a critical feature, thank you, uh, a critical feature um, <clears throat> of that case was that um, the parents had said they would bring, if deported, they'd bring the children with them. Um, I suppose one can understand that because the children were really little more than babes in arms. But if you change the facts and you have a situation whereby, um, as we've had subsequently, cases whereby um, you've had, say, an Irish national married to a Nigerian uh, and you've got young children, um, is it permissible to make a deportation order, order against, say, the non-national father? I mean, uh, I don't speak about any of my cases, but I had some cases like this, um, whereby you had uh, uh, an Irish national living in not very, not very well circumstanced, um, <clears throat> living on social security, in public housing, two or three children, um, uh, married to a Nigerian, the Nigerian, uh, uh, an asylum order made against the Nigerian, and um, what's the situation there? Now, rightly or wrongly, I indicated that I consider that that was a breach of the substance of the right to family life as protected <clears throat> under the Irish Constitution, because the idea that the young mother in those circumstances could realistically go to Nigeria with the young children uh, didn't seem to me to be very uh, realistic. Uh, and I pose the question, how would family life be maintained in these circumstances? <clears throat> and could you envisage really that um, uh, a young mother with young children living on social security would be able to, for example, travel to Nigeria to meet her husband to, to, to keep up family life so that the, the children would even get to see the husband uh, and their father. Um, it, that didn't seem to me uh, to be a real, a real possibility. Now, <clears throat> I appreciate there's different views and cross currents of judicial opinion on this, but I merely just make that point to show just how uh, difficult the whole question of respect for family life is <clears throat> in the asylum context. Um, uh, my, I, I see I'm uh, over time and I'm going to um, self-discipline myself for once and sit down, but I'll just say this um, uh, before I do, um, which is, is that I think it has to be realized in this context as well, that delay, unfortunately, is intrinsic in the asylum system. Now, um, one of the reasons is this, <clears throat> is that, uh, it's a hugely difficult task for those ch charged with applying the asylum system, be it administrators, um, uh, members of immigration tribunals, judges, um, to ascertain precisely what happened uh, in, to use Neville Chamberlain's words about faraway countries of which we know little, um, um, uh, three or four or five years ago. Th you know, when, when, as an asylum judge when it is encountered with frequent stories of appalling things that are said to have happened in country, in trouble spots throughout the world, these things could be true. But equally, uh, they could be fabrications. But the task of endeavouring to ascertain um, whether it is or might be true is a really difficult one. That's especially so given that administrators and judges can't call um, uh, evidence from, say, the local militia <coughs> who are said to have been uh, working in, or uh, operating in a particular area, or uh, they've got linguistic difficulties, cultural difficulties, in trying to understand really whether a claim about political corruption and the, threat, the, the threats Posed in some uh, particular, uh, again, distant country of which the, the judge barely knows the, what the capital of the country is, even if he does, um, or she, he or she does. That's a really difficult problem, and that means there are delays <coughs> that are intrinsic in the asylum process. Obviously, um, matters can be addressed in relation to that they have to be minimised, but um, that's one of the, uh, the reasons, ladies and gentlemen, why the question of family life uh, and the 
balance between the necessity for effective immigration control on the one hand and the public interest in that <clears throat> and something which which as all Europeans we cherish very deeply, the protection of family life on the other is a really difficult one. <clears throat> I don't have the solution um, and uh, many, um, many courts I think throughout Europe as I say have struggled with this problem and maybe there isn't a solution but uh, it's, that is the inter internal dilemma that's going to confront us both at national courts <clears throat> court of justice level and at ECHR level and I think therefore it behoves us all that to go back to the words of the Czech Constitutional Court in its, in its Lisbon decision in the degree of uh, not so much a hierarchical approach but discussion and dialogue and interplay between um, the National Constitutional Court, the Court of Justice and the ECHR uh, is the best way forward. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much.